Brothers and sisters, I've always wanted to say this. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> when you come to Hawaii as a tourist and you go out uh, on uh, one of the boats going up, up to the, the uh, Fern Grotto or something like that, that is the first thing that is said, and that's the way it's said by the, by the person who's running the tour. And I, I don't think in, in normal life you quite accent the alo quite that, that much, but anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Hawaii is just uh, one of our very favorite places. Uh, we've brought our family here many times. Typically, we have stayed uh, on the island of Kauai, and uh, as you all know, that is quite the wet uh, island, about like yesterday and the day before yesterday, or I guess it was Monday, we drove up uh, here from the airport on Monday, uh, and hardest rainstorm uh, we've ever been in, except for upstate New York once, just outside of Palmyra. Well, I, also, I should also say that I, I didn't realize that this was going to be recorded, and so I don't, there are some trade secrets that I was going to give away, and I don't know if I can still do that. Just, just kidding. What I would like to do, sorry, what I would like to do is uh, divide my comments into kind of three broad categories. Uh, what it's like to be an entrepreneur, that is to say sort of a, a day in the life, or in my case, 30 years in the life of an entrepreneur and some of the experiences that, uh, that you have uh, on a daily basis. And then a third of it, regarding the, uh, the kind of development that my, my company did, which is building, developing uh, actually means to, to, change, to uh, define that uh, apart from building. Developing means bringing all of the assets together, the idea, the funding, uh, the construction, the operation. So everything having to do with with something that is built on real property and that you can, you can see it, you can, you can open the door and walk in and you can hear the noise and, and that's a development. And so I'd like to talk about the development of green energy and to just to, so you can put some headings in your notes in order that would be hydroelectric power, wind power, solar power, and finally geothermal power which is uh, power from the earth, using heat from the earth. And then finally, what about the ethics of uh, our business and what role does our faith, what role does God play in these efforts? And hopefully I can get that done in, is it 45 minutes? How long am I supposed to, uh, are we supposed to be here? Till 10-2? 10 to 5-2. 10 or 5-2, okay. I used to have a saying when I, when I do introduce uh, myself uh, for church talks, uh, I, t I tell the audience now, if you get through listening before I get through talking, just raise your hand. The, the uh, first time I did that, uh, we had an, an eight-year-old son who rose his hand. <laughs> so I had to stop talking very soon. Years ago, I was a faculty member in the finance department at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And th this, was, uh, uh, this was the realization of a dream. Uh, after getting a master's in business, I went into the army for a couple of years, and when I came out, there was kind of a depression in uh, hiring of finance people. Uh, I got an interview once with a chemical bank a big bank from New York, and they took me up uh, to the floor and showed me where I would start. And this was an open floor without any columns. It, it must have been three acres. Just this open floor, and there was just desk after desk after desk after desk. You'll start here, Mr. Johnson. And I thought, I can't do that. That does not, that just does not look interesting or fun. So. I went into teaching for a while at the University of Utah to uh, sort of see if the economy would change a little bit and also just to see how I enjoyed teaching. 
And um, I taught fi corporate finance and real estate and investments, uh, money and banking. And uh, it was different enough that, uh, that every quarter, every year uh, was fun. It was different because the economy was changing, the students were changing, and it was a nice place to be. Then one day, I was teaching a real estate course, and I had given the students uh, an assignment to go out on the economy, go out in Salt Lake City, and find a real estate development or a real estate opportunity and write a paper on it. And uh, at the same time I did that, I, I went down the street from where we lived and uh, looked at a new uh, condominium development and made some notes uh, so I could compare that with what the students came up with. And lo and behold, during the, re the reporting of uh, these papers, one of the students has, was working on the very building that I was using as an example. And I said, well, that's interesting, and, and uh, uh, are you involved with that? And he says, oh, yes, it's mine, I'm building it. And I thought, when my students are start starting to tell me stories about doing what I'm teaching, I've got to get out of here and join the real world. And that's not to say that education isn't the real world, but you have to get outside of education, uh, education if you want to be able to uh, afford to raise six sons in Salt Lake City. So, I went into partnership with some friends from the university. One partner was the vice president of the university for, for development, which means raising funds. One partner was the assistant uh, director of the, economic, the Bureau of Economic Research. And one partner was uh, a lawyer who was also a CPA, an accountant. And right from the get-go, I guess I would say, here's my first lesson about being an entrepreneur or about, about starting any kind of a business. If you're going to have partners, choose good partners. If you have to make it a matter of prayer, do that. You want to have partners who are just as attuned to the spirit as you are, just as willing to work as hard as you, are honest and frankly think like you do. A lot of partnerships fall apart because of, of a shortage of those ingredients. Well, what we were going to do is raise money, uh, do commercial lending in, in this small organization for real estate or for corporate finance or anyone who needed a little money should come to us because we were experts. Uh, we had taught all about it. None of us had ever raised money, but we'd taught about it a lot. Well, we, we got one customer and, and uh, raised some money, and in the course of doing that, uh, one of my partners bumped into an engineer. And, uh, you know, you can always tell, you can always tell an engineer, just not very much. Any engineers out there? Just kidding. And uh, this man uh, came to us and said, what I'm doing is building small hydroelectric facilities. Can you fund us? And this, this uh, so we did one of those. Uh, we raised money for a small project out in eastern Utah uh, for a company called the Moon Lake Water Users. It was the local canal company out there. It's a very small project, and, and they were very reliable, and so it wasn't very hard to raise the money. And we, we took a very small commission for that. Uh, it may have been $5 million, and we took maybe 2%. And, and uh, after, we got, after the dust cleared, we thought, gosh, that wasn't very much money for an office and four people and a, and a couple of uh, secretaries to help us. And then, this will, this will date me, the first Apple computers came out. And I kind of disappeared into the back room and played with the, the earnings from this kind of a development, from this uh, power plant. And found that rather than raising money and being the finance agent, the best opportunities were to develop these hydroelectric plants and get someone else to fund them, build them, and run them. 
and sometimes sell them. And in that case, rather than 2% of $5 million, you often took $5 million and turned it into seven or eight by the time the dust cleared. And we could afford to raise six cents on a fourth of that. That's a little, that's a little simple. But that's, but that's the concept. Building, developing, running, changing the face of the earth, harnessing all this water that's just running down the stream. In Utah, it means running down into the Great Salt Lake and not doing anyone any good, at least much good, was much more profitable and interesting than just raising the capital. Well, so we, we started going around uh, northern Utah and southern Idaho looking for opportunities. And interestingly enough, the, the uh, next one that came up to us was a hydroelectric uh, opportunity in a canyon above the small town of Manti. Maybe you would recognize that name uh, as being the, uh, the location of a temple, the Manti Temple. It's about 125 miles south of Salt Lake City. And it was a particularly small, it would be a particularly small unit uh, just uh, relying on the snow melt coming down a canyon. Well, I had a friend who worked for the church uh, finance department or investment department, a high school friend whom I hadn't seen since high school. So I called him up and said, uh, we're, we've got this uh, hydro project we'd like to finance. And I thought I'd give the church the first chance, the first right at helping us out. And lo and behold, we actually got a, a, a commitment from the church to do this small hydroelectric plant, which I thought was all time for the church to do that. Of course, it was helping the local people, and the local people are all Mormons, and they're all farmers, and, and just scratching out an existence. And, the, and so then the developers were Mormons, so it's just natural that they would do this. Unfortunately, we didn't develop that one. But it was sure fun uh, to see that the church would do that. Finally, we, we just really got in the groove. We put uh, some ads out in the industry, in the small hydro industry, and said, come to us. We will finance and develop your project and give you a royalty when everything is done. And from that point forward, for about six years, we built hydro projects as fast as we could. We built 10 projects in six years. Just working hard, working late, raising money all over the country and, and uh, coming out with, with a money machine for the farmers. We would, uh, we would do one of two things. Either you do a run of the river hydro, which means you would just uh, divert water out of a, out of a running stream and put it into a canal or put it into a pipe and, and drop it down. You have to have a drop, drop it down to the, uh, to the turbine and generator. And that was based on snow melt. So you could either have amazing years, standard years, or terrible years. But interestingly enough, we found out from the people who uh, finance hydros that uh, that doesn't matter. They know that in the end they'll be paid because it always rains and always snows. And maybe it'll take 50 years to get their money back, but they will get their money back. So uh, we had great lenders. The other kind of project we would do was uh, a little more standard, or a little more, uh, a little less risky. We started working with canal companies uh, in, uh, in the arid western United States. Canals are the lifeblood of the farmers. Uh, you would have canals that would carry as, as much as the biggest uh, river in northern Utah and deliver it to the water uh, owners uh, just during the growing season. So these canals would have water in them from perhaps April to October. But we found that just running our projects that long, but dependably, was just as profitable as having a run of the river project. And we were working again with good people, working with these uh, canal companies, and they, they got a royalty, and, and we got fees, and the lender got his interest, and all was right with the world. I should explain a little bit why, why this, uh, this area was such a hotbed when we started. 
and a little bit of a digression about being an entrepreneur. You can study how to be an entrepreneur, and you can study the lives of other entrepreneurs, but I've always believed that in any successful uh, business or effort, there has to be a certain amount of serendipity, luck, or maybe, a, maybe call it a blessing, where all of the ingredients come together at the right time and aid you in, in uh, developing your idea. You find, you find good people, and the environment may be just right for what you're doing. The government, when we started, the government had just passed some uh, laws uh, designed to encourage the, uh, the construction of green energy projects. And to, to encourage that construction, they had offered what, uh, what are called tax credits, federal tax credits. Now, a federal tax credit would come from the government and be a dollar amount that would reduce your taxes dollar for dollar. It's not like an expense that you take off your income tax return. You'd file your income tax return and then you'd get a check from the government paying you back dollar for dollar what you had paid in taxes. And before the government did this particular law, uh, there was a 10% tax credit on just virtually anything you built that had cement and steel in it. Buildings and power plants and cement plants and so forth and so on. Well, they added, the government came along and added another 11% to that for hydro, 15% for geothermal, which meant you'd have a 21% tax credit given back to the investors. That's as big as their down payment was. So they'd put in maybe a 20%, maybe even a 15% down payment. We'd raise the debt to do it, and they'd get a government check back for their down payment. And when your investment is very nearly zero, the returns are quite amazing in percentage terms. Well, that had just been passed, and everyone, it, it was kind of like uh, the real estate business was a few years ago. You know, when, when the houses were selling, mortgages were being sold by, by everyone and uh, his sister or her brother. You know, you'd talk to a mortgage broker and, and he'd say, oh yes, I've got lots of experience. Yesterday I was a plumber, today I'm a mortgage broker. Come and uh, I'll find you some money. That's kind of the way it was about alternative energy at this time. Uh, there were people who'd been real estate agents or school teachers, like I was. Yesterday I was a school teacher. Today, I'm a developer of hydroelectric plants and you can come to me and I know what I'm doing and you will be so impressed. And blessedly, it worked because our little group worked hard and we were honest and you'd be surprised how how attributes like that transfer to the people you're raising money from, uh, investment money, and to the bankers. Sometimes the bankers were so far removed from, from investing in a uh, power plant that they weren't exactly sure how you got electricity out of water. And we'd have to explain to them again uh, how, you, how you do that, how you drop water a distance down and it turns a turbine which turns a generator which creates the electricity and they'd say oh oh yeah and uh, if you were an Eagle Scout it was even better but if you were honest and open and didn't try to sell anything that wasn't true you you would get amazing response from the most hard-bitten lenders and uh, steely-eyed investors well so we did uh, 10 or 12 hydroelectric plants, and they're just wonderful. As I said before, sometimes they go up and down with the, uh, with the rainfall, but they run forever. Because think about it, the, the only moving part is a large turbine, and it is lubricated by the water that's going through it. So it has very low wear. The first hydroelectric project in the United States was built in 1988 in Appleton, Wisconsin. Nin uh, 1888, excuse me, 1888. It's still operating. My great-grandfather, 
who was uh, mayor of Logan City in northern Utah, had the city build a uh, hydroelectric plant in 1913. It's still running. You have to replace a few things to wear out, the rubber around the wire, but the turbines are still spinning. Okay, enough, oh, okay, now the third part. Well, going back to the first part and then the third part. Being an entrepreneur, for one reason, is really enjoyable because every day is different. When we were doing hydroelectric projects, we'd fly from Salt Lake to southern Idaho in a small plane, which was sometimes fun, sometimes exciting. And we'd go out, we'd meet with these farmers who were just hardworking men and women and sit around a kitchen table drinking orange Kool-Aid and talking them into giving us their water rights so we could make them some money. And then you'd go back to Salt Lake and you'd put on your pinstripe suit and you'd fly to Los Angeles or you'd fly to New York City and talk with the most sophisticated bankers and insurance executives. We would get a lot of loans from insurance people. And so I guess you'd say that your activities are eclectic. You're always doing something different, something um, interesting. Now, where does, where does our religion fit in, in this? We had one project. Um, it was our first project of any size. And it was on a canal company. And one of the things we had to do with these was get them started before the end of the year. Because all of our investors had put their, their money up with the thought that they would get their tax credits back for that year. So they'd invest in April or May, and December 31st sometimes, we'd, we'd try to start these plants uh, earlier, but it always ended up being New Year's Eve when we were trying to turn these plants on. You had to actually generate electricity for the tax credits to be paid back by the government. And so for the next four or five years, I was the designated partner who spent New Year's Eve standing in, usually in Idaho, uh, the temperature would undoubtedly be below zero, uh, and standing around waiting for people to get these darn things going. Well, in this one particular project, it was called the Low Line, we could not get the generator to start. The canal company had generously filled up its canal with water so that we could start it on the last day of the year. We used to have detractors who'd say, who said, you guys, must, you guys are a bunch of swindlers. You can't start a project in the middle of the year like, or at the end of the year like that. And we had to explain that, you know, water does store. And it was in the canal, and they just turned it loose. Oh, and that was an exciting night. It was so cold. We had one of, one of the guys fell into the water. One of the engineers, young engineers, fell into the water. And when the water is 35 and the air is... 10 degrees, that guy can't get warm. You pull him out, you put him in a truck, and you drive him to the nearest farmhouse, and he takes a bath from some nice lady who, uh, who doesn't know him from Adam, but will let this, this shivering person have a bath in her, in her home. Well, it wouldn't start, and it wouldn't start, and it wouldn't start, and we called the president of the company that made the generators. We, we were shameless. We talked to anybody. So we called up and we got this guy. He was at a New Year's Eve party with his wife and all his friends. We got him off the dance floor and said, what, what can we do? What is going, what is going on with, with your generator here? And he gave us some ideas. We tried them. It didn't work. didn't work. And so about 11 p.m., we were just really discouraged, the partners. There were three of us uh, at that place just because it was such an important project. And we decided, well, we'll go into town and go to a movie. We stopped, but we stopped by the side of the road um, before going to the movie and just asked Heavenly Father to help us. Inspire these engineers, inspire these fine construction people with some way to start up this generator. 
And then we went in, into the movie. We didn't see any angels at that point. When we came back from the theater, everyone was jumping around and they ran out to the car and they said, we started it, we started it. And, and we said, how, how on earth did you finally get that started? Well, it turns out that the chief electrician on the site had been in the business a long time. And what happened is that there, uh, one, uh, one item kept, kept blowing. I think it was what they call a capacitor, or it may have been a resistor. There must be some electricians out there who know what those things are. And it kept popping. Well, he went back to his home, went down in the basement, and rummaged through all of the old electrical parts he'd had from 20 or 30 years of being an electrician and found a huge capacitor. Usually they're, they're rather small, but the bigger they are, the harder they are to pop, to break. And he went down and put that in line and it held. Not all night, it held for about 10 minutes, but we got electricity on the wire and we got our investors their tax credits. And we think it was directly because of that prayer. Okay. I think I had one other. Oh, yes, here's one other uh, religious story to tell you about. In, in building these projects, and this is the same today as it was back then, the utilities, the, the, the regular utilities of, of the earth, really don't like developers of alternative energy. We're just, we're, we're just a fly on their back. And they wish we'd go away. And we're, we're, we're making money by what the government told the utility to do. They, the, the utilities were told they have to buy this power. They have to buy this power. They don't have to pay very much for it. And we had one project that was waiting for a power contract, and it was getting closer and closer, as you can imagine, to the end of the year. Well, these are all end-of-the-year stories. And we sent our, our oldest, most distinguished-looking partner up to visit with the people at Idaho Power Company. Now, I've got to describe these folks. You know, the, the linemen and the people driving trucks and climbing poles were just great people. But the folks in Boise who were running Idaho Power, and I don't mean this meanly, but they believed that the state was named after them. They were quite sure that they discovered electricity and they owned the Snake and the Columbian Rivers, Columbia Rivers. They were, in other words, they were pretty haughty. And so there again, we had to get a, a signature from these people to, to start this plant. And on that time, we fasted and prayed. The other partners, the, the other three of us, we fasted and prayed for 24 hours. Uh, so that it would also go over the meeting time where our partner was up in Boise. And blessedly and thankfully, what we got, what, what we needed, we got from the power company. And from that point on, had a much better relationship with them. So the Lord helps you, even if you're, if you're just dealing with money, but it's more than money. The, the wealth that we generated helped farmers, it helped us, it, helped, it uh, gave returns to the banks, and we like to think that it helped the utilities, but they still don't think so. <laughs> they didn't want to buy our little smidgens of power. Well, one, one idea for some of you folks who are here from, from small uh, island countries uh, or places that are still developing and uh, uh, you, don't have, you don't have the wherewithal to put in a, a large power plant or maybe even the rivers or the canals to put the power plant on, a hydro plant. You can do it on very small streams. And, and you can do it, th this is the part that's interesting. A hydroelectric turbine and generator is basically a reverse pump. You know how it, with a pump, you pump water out if you put electricity in. Well, with a, with a, a hydroelectric project, if you reverse that, if you put water in, you get electricity. And all of the bells and whistles and, and ingredients that you need to produce power is in that pump. You don't have to go out and buy huge pieces of equipment. 
you just hook a pump up between the water, basically. You have to get permission to, to put on your, your electricity on the power line. But it's that simple. And if, so if you've got a little stream, or if you know someone who's got a little stream, and you could put it in a pipe so it, has, so it gets some pressure, you could try that. And you could buy a pump for $500 that would do that. And if the, if the utility wouldn't let you put it on their line, you could put it over to your farmhouse and you'd have power, more power than you wanted all day, every day. Wind. We believe we could do anything. Yesterday we were a hydro developer and now we're a wind developer. We uh, had various projects brought to us and, and uh, we had a wind project brought to us uh, at one point in time and, and this was located on a bluff in, uh, in the pass. Now a lot of you probably haven't been to Southern California, but if you go from Los Angeles to a town called Palm Springs, you go through a, a, a narrow pass where the wind blows uh, twice a day for about three hours a time at 20 or 30 miles an hour. And the reason it does this that, is that uh, in the daytime, the sun count comes out, the desert on the other side of this pass warms up, and the cool ocean air flows up that pass and just It'll knock you off your feet someday, standing, standing in that. That's in the morning. And in the evening, the opposite happens. The desert cools down and becomes colder than the ocean, and the air comes streaming down the other direction. So your windmill is turning when people are getting up, getting ready to go to, go to uh, work, uh, cooking their breakfast. The, the, all the lights are on because you're getting the kids off to school and in the afternoon. It's hot and you've just turned your air conditioners on and the kids are coming back from school. At those points in time, these, these wind turbines were just twirling away. And the power contract paid peak money for these periods. Not much for the periods in between when the, when the uh, propellers were going around, but they paid for these particular peak times. And so it was, it was like it was a project made in heaven. And let's see, uh, the eclectic opportunities. The manufacturers of our turbines were from Denmark. And it was a lot of fun to fly to Copenhagen and talk to these folks. And the Danes are just the nicest people. And they're funny. And they laughed at my jokes. <laughs> and we got some investment money from Germans. The Germans aren't as funny, but, uh, but they're rigorous. And what they say they, do, they will do, they really do. And I was a German missionary. So I got to practice my language, meet all these nice Germans, and, and uh, bring, at that time, there, there weren't euros, there were Deutschmarks, there were German marks. And they were very strong against the dollar, so they loved, loved to uh, invest. Southern Cal Edison was the utility, and they were really pretty good to work with. These projects, uh, though, though kind of a new old technology, you know, the technology has been there since, I don't know when, the 16th century? When did the Dutch start, start putting up windmills? Um, but uh, these projects, th these, t these uh, uh, machines had towers 200 feet tall. They had blades, three blades that were the length of a 727 wing going up there like that, hitting mics. And, uh, but uh, that, that project is still going after, after 20 years, it's still producing power. Now, another slight digression. All is not uh, just sweetness and light in these projects. There are some people who don't like them and Typically, it's, it's the, with hydro projects, it might be folks who are trying to protect the salmon who are coming upstream and they're worried that your, your project is going to decrease the, the uh, population of salmon in the stream. Or in one case, we had uh, protests from a bunch of kayakers, kayakers on the uh, 
Snake River who believed that we were going to take too much water out of the river. So you have public hearings and you try to explain the, that there's enough water for everyone. And, and by the way, have you, have you guys ever voted right there? Well, no. But uh, so we, you had to deal with some folks like that. And uh, just recently, in the wind business, the, uh, the government, the federal government, has decided that in the Mountain West, where there are a lot of raptors, you know, raptors are the birds that, that eat meat. They're the hawks, the falcons, the eagles, the buzzards. There's a joke about that. Did you hear about the, uh, the buzzard who was walking into the airplane and, and he had a he had a, a dead animal under each wing, and the, uh, the attendant said, I'm sorry, sir, only one carry-on at a time. <laughs> you know, carry-on is dead meat. <laughs> sorry. Just trying to wake up some people there. Okay, the government, you know, the government giveth and the government taketh away. Right now, the government has wonderful tax credits. Uh, it's, and it's, it's the Obama government. They came and, and he said he was going to work on alternative energy, and he has. The tax credits are phenomenal. They found that one of the problems with using tax credits is you have to have positive tax requirements. You, you have to be taxed for a tax credit to work. If you weren't making enough money to pay taxes, the tax credit was worthless. So, the government said, well, if you have no use for the tax credits, what you can do in, in lieu of taking the tax credits is take a 30% grant of money towards building your project. So in this case, you're building a $10 million wind farm, $10 million hydro. When you're done, the government gives you a $3 million blue and gray government check. To, towards the cost of the project. And you'd be surprised how that helps your return if you're only paying 70% of the cost of actually constructing it, but still getting 100% of the revenues from selling the electricity to the utility. So right now, that is a wonderful thing. But the government sometimes taketh away. Uh, the folks who are in the uh, kind of the interior department uh, now have de decided that uh, uh, they, the, the too many raptors are being killed by flying into wind, wind uh, blades. And the, the folks who are in that business don't think that, uh, that that's the case. That, that, that is to say there aren't any more raptors killed by the moving blades than there are by windshields or planes or thing, things like that, fl flying into a radio tower, flying into a power line. Well, the folks are convinced that uh, these big uh, blades, and if you've been up the, the street towards the, the North Shore, and if you looked at those new towers, how fast are they going? If they're going, it's like that. Eagles can see eight times better than we can, You'd think that they could see those, don't you? <laughs> but the government says you cannot build within 10 miles of an eagle's nest unless you do an extensive survey of every inch of ground in a 10-mile diameter piece of property. And so that has really slowed the business up a lot. Well, for the, for the, for the small installation, Go home, if you're, if you're in, a, in a country that, that uh, has electricity that's on and off all the time, but you've got a lot of wind, the big ones now are 400 feet tall, and they have an elevator inside the tower. They're so big. And the blades are as big as 747 wings. They just keep getting bigger. Well, you probably can't put one of those on, on uh, Oahu. But you can buy, um, and here I'll, I'll just use the name of a company, you can buy a Jacobs windmill. 
They've been around for years and years and years. And if you, may have, you may see them uh, uh, around, around here sometime, somewhere or maybe in an advertisement. Their towers are, are, are just put together, by, put together by the local people. You know, it's a, just a little trellis and it's about 20 feet tall. And the, the uh, turbine looks like your ordinary house fan. And it's sitting up on the top and that will generate enough electricity for a, a 2,000 square foot house. Sometimes, of course, the wind doesn't blow, so you have to put it into a battery. Okay. Let's see, I've got five minutes and only 20 minutes left of material. <laughs> solar, just quick about solar. The nice thing about solar is you can buy these photovoltaic sheets and put them anywhere. Uh, it's better if, if uh, they're in the sun. As a matter of fact, they don't work if they're in the shade. That's the trouble with solar. When you put a solar plant up, sun goes behind a cloud, bam. It does, the electricity doesn't slow down. It goes off. And then when the sun comes out, it's right back up. And the poor utility people, so they have a stream of, of electricity coming in that's like this. Unless it's not a cloudy day. And so they're working on that. But for photovoltaic, you talk about people who are against things, you don't even have to get a building permit to put up a photovoltaic field. And you can, you can put it on, in as large a, a group of, of uh, uh, little machines as you want. So it can, it can power your house, it can power a school, it can power a hospital, depending on the size, and if you, if you want a really large field, it, it can power a 100,000 uh, person city. Finally, and this is, this is what I think is kind of the, uh, the, one of the great hopes for all of us in this day and age of of uh, increasing use and supposedly declining fossil fuels and so forth. Geothermal. This is based on water beneath the surface of the earth that is heated by hot rocks. Sometimes 9,000 feet down. Sometimes 400 feet down. So for a geothermal project you have a drilling risk you have your experts look at the geology and so forth and maybe drill a little test hole. And, but sometimes you hit a dry hole. So it's a little risk, more risky that way. But when you find the well, you know two things. The rocks are going to be hot forever. Or at least until the second coming. And it's all the time. It's it's 24-7, not like most of the other alternative energy projects, on and off with the sun, on and off with the wind, on and off with the rainfall. This is, uh, this is what the utilities just love. And just a quick description of how this is done. In the old days, you know, you've probably seen pictures of this steam, superheated steam, blowing out of a pipe, and it's come from deep in the earth. How in the world are you going to contain that superheated steam? It's got impurities in it. If you get in the way, it'll kill you. I mean, it's dangerous, and impurities, and the neighbors don't like it. Well, what they have found is that very quietly, all you need to do is put a pump down your well, you bring this water up and put it into a heat exchanger. Now this, this is a, let's call it a, a barrel. This is a barrel into which you run the hot water and from, from over here you run in a fluid that boils at less than, than 212, 212 Fahrenheit. So you're exchanging the heat, a liquid like Freon like you use in your car air conditioner. Or isopentane is the fluid they often use, and it's just the same as Freon. So you come in there, that hot water 
but turns the freon into steam. The steam drives a turbine. The turbine drives the generator. And there's your electricity. And it's as steady as clockwork. It's not dangerous because it's lower pressure. And the, di the differential, you can, you can do this with water that don't, is only 180 degrees. It doesn't boil anywhere, down below, up top. But 180 degrees will cause Freon to boil and drive the turbines. So my belief is that geothermal is, is one of our great hopes. The main problem is uh, the geothermal properties are, are generally out in the boonies, out in the desert. And often they're, they're in very sensitive uh, places like national parks. Uh, just think of Old Faithful putting that baby in a tube. How many have been to Old Faithful? A few of you. Of you. I, hope, I hope you all get to go there. So that's about my time. Developing energy is really a lot of fun. And uh, you can do it, you can build big plants or little plants depending on where you are and how much money you have. And one final comment about the Lord and all this business. One of the, one of the great individuals in uh, history uh, was Larry H. Miller. Now, some of you folks may not have uh, heard of, of him. He was the owner of the Jazz basketball team. He had a lot of... Uh, car dealerships, and many other kinds of businesses. And he started his life as a, a parts manager of a car dealership in Grand Junction, Colorado, Colorado little, little town in western Colorado. One day he was visiting in Salt Lake City, and a friend of his, he'd always wanted to buy this guy's auto dealership. And this one particular visit, his friend finally wanted to sell it. And they sat down over lunch and wrote a contract. This is a napkin. Entrepreneurs often write their first contract on the back of a napkin or the back of an envelope. And this, this thing lasted for Larry Miller until he died, virtually. Well, Larry, at that time, was not active in the church. And they decided they needed to move to Salt Lake. And I don't know, I don't remember who talked him into paying his tithing, but someone said, well, Larry, you've got to pay your tithing. And so he started paying his tithing. And from that time on, his career was a meteor. That was only about 1978. And he went from a, from a young man with, uh, with young children and a net worth of perhaps $100,000, maybe had $100,000 in savings, to a man with this far-flung uh, business that's, we don't even know what it's worth in Utah, and it, it never actually got out, but I'm sure that it was at least $500 million. And he did that in, let's see, 12 plus 10, whatever, 30 years. Same time I was building power contracts. I mean, power plants. Anyway, good to be with you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord give you great ideas to help your people. And I know he will. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.